Hello, everybody, and welcome to Teaching the Arts, my podcast. I'm Peter Hawley. Thanks for coming back. Episode number nine. Today, it's uh, a two-parter. Uh, Jack Newell, uh, program director of the Harold Ramis Film School at the Second City here in Chicago, is up first. And then a graduate of the Harold Ramis Film School, uh, Danya Khan, is up ne- uh, after Jack. And uh, very interesting conversations. Jack tells us all about the film school, its philosophy, where it came from, where its goals are. And then Danya talks about uh, the student experience and, and her uh, experience uh, moving forward and what she wants to do with her career. Really, really interesting conversation. So uh, that's coming up in just a minute. I got an email, so thank you. Uh, The question was, how do you teach in the world of YouTube where the resources are so many? If you're teaching uh, Premiere, you know the students can easily go to YouTube or some other resource, including Adobe itself, to learn just as much as our structured curriculum can give them, if not more. Well, that is a a real question, and I'm, I'm going to turn it around like I do as a teacher. I don't give an answer. I like the students to give me answers. And um, I don't know what to do. I actually think I use the internet as a resource. I don't, I don't teach on YouTube. I don't teach through YouTube. I don't say, hey, go to YouTube and figure it out. I like the students to figure it out. But if going to YouTube and figuring some things out, isn't it not unlike a take-home test or something like that, where you know the goal is that they learn the, the concepts and the ideas. And if they learn it through YouTube and they really know it, that's okay. Uh, I don't think that replaces, you know, in-person teaching and mentorship, but um, I, I think that that's a um, a really uh, interesting question, and and I'd like to hear what other people think about, uh, you know, teaching in the world of YouTube and other online resources. Uh, you can email me through the website teachingintheArts.com or directly at teachingintheArts at gmail.com. So uh, up now is my part one of my conversation with uh, the Harold Ramis Film School folks, uh, Jack Newell. Jack is someone I've known for a long, long time. He actually refers to it. Uh, I was a teacher of his at Columbia College in Chicago a dozen years or so ago. Um, He uh, went on to uh, do work for Second City, as he tells us. He's got a uh, documentary on Netflix right now called 42 Grams and a whole other bunch of work in the can. Is In fact, he left here to go uh, oversee an edit of a feature he's doing right now. So here is my conversation with Jack Newell, program director of the Harold Ramis Film School at the Second City. Jack Newell, welcome. Hi. How are you? I'm good. How are you? I'm good. So so uh, tell us about the Harold Ramis Film School at Second City. Yeah, there you go. Um, <laughs> so we are a one-year-long program, uh, non-accredited, non-certificate granting uh, at the Second City. And it's uh, we kind of view ourselves as teaching comedic storytelling. So that sounds like it transcends film, and it, it sort of does in... in theory or in, in what we're aiming for, but we are teaching filmmakers. Um, and it's, uh, you have to apply to get in and it's fairly rigorous. Um, and the year is essentially the most intense year of the most intense and funny year of your life, I would say. <laughs> well, you know, we talked to Danya Khan and yeah. she's up next and, and, uh, you know, she said, you know, it was, was intense, but she loved it. So, so are people, what are, what's the attraction for students? Is it the second city? Is it Comedy, is it a one-year thing? What, why do people come? Yeah, it's a lot of things. I mean, we kind of bill ourselves as the only school, the only film school focused entirely on comedy. So there's a couple other programs that exist currently in the United States that have comedy components, uh, a couple other schools that have minors in it and mm. you can take a couple classes. You know, any school is going to have like, you know, sure. the films of Charlie Chaplin yeah. or whatever. But most of the time you're not watching those films. And so, you know, in the rest of your experience. And so one of the things was there's a... We found that there was a need for comedy instruction in the film space because when I know when I went to film school, like that was not really a thing. No. And most film schools are ultra serious. Yeah. I'm speaking generally. Yeah, no, I agree with you. And, you know, look at if you even want to go to like talk about the Oscars, which just happened a little while ago. I mean, how many everyone was talking about like Get Out, you know, it's the first comedy in a long time. And that's arguable if it is even a comedy yeah, yeah. or just a very smart social satire. Mm-hmm. Um, You know, the first Academy Award was a comedy and then never again, you know. Annie Hall. Yeah, and then Annie Hall, sure. So (laughs) 1975, So so every 60 years. Yeah, so, (laughs) and so there's a kind of duality here because in terms of pop culture, comedy is very important. I mean, I think most of what Mm -hmm. people watch and any normal person would watch is comedy. On the critical side, they're not really, 
you know, you go to film festivals, you go to award shows. I mean, it's not, they don't really, no. so there's a weird disconnect there. And so, you know, there's people who want to get schooling in and need practice in comedy. And so we're, we're finding people coming from a lot of different areas. One is people who went to film school who just didn't get that comedy addressed. And so they have technical knowledge. Mm. They, they have some understanding of film, but they don't really have comedy training. We have people who have comedy training who actually have already done either comedy studies or the conservatory program at Second City who, like, want to get into film and be a content creator. Sure. And then we have people who are a little bit sort of not either of those people. I would say Danya would be one of those mm -hmm. who's just kind of in film school, wants to express themselves, thinks satire and comedy is a mode of expression, mm -hmm. and film is the dominant art form, and so that's how that fits in. That's great. And I think the year-long is very attractive. Yeah. We can do in one year what a lot of places do in four, to be just yeah. completely frank. So, yeah, I, I, I you know, I, I know just because I know you and I've talked to her, but just run through the curriculum broadly. What, what did they take? Yeah, so like I, I said up top, we're non-accredited, non-certificate granting, but we the rigor is probably master's or PhD level, mm -hmm. uh, and that's how we treated it when we created it. You're in 18 hours a week in class, and we treat it like credit hours, so every eight hour in class you're expected to do work out of class, so 18 hours in plus 18 hours out probably in terms of, of workload. So it's, it's, it's a lot. We break it down into three main categories. One is uh, film production, which is produ producing and directing, essentially, or production and directing. Mm -hmm. um, that is probably the closest thing to what a traditional film school yeah. would look like. Lots of hands-on experience. I mean, you're shooting immediately. Mm -hmm. we're, we're using iPhones. We're using iPads. Huh. We're just trying to get you up in storytelling yeah. as quickly as possible, yeah. culminating in a short film. The second track, storytelling is what we call it. So there's a storytelling classes and then a run of screenwriting classes. And probably in the end, the screenwriting classes, the outcome is the same. We just get to it in a different way. It's a very Second City way of getting to it. There's a couple of things that permeate all of our classes, creating from abundance, yes, and understanding collaboration, um, not self-critic, you know, don't mm -hmm. self-censor yourself or your teammates. Uh, and that is that takes a lot of what we have to do in terms of like, I don't want to say reprogramming, but it, as we teach the students a new way to think, because that's what Second City really is, mm -hmm. doing, teaching a new way to think. Mm -hmm. And approach problems. Um, so that storytelling track, and then the third one we called comedy theory, and that's two classes that seem like they don't connect, but they actually do. One is almost looking backwards, which would be film analysis, television analysis. Uh, you know, watching the great comedies and you know watching the great television shows, and then a third level class called films of the point of view, where we get to explore maybe auteur theory, but more just the intentionality of the artist and how can you make films and television shows that try to speak to a larger social message hmm. and then improv that you also take and you so you take a year of improvisation wow. and it's interesting because you're not taking an improvisation to become a performer it's so like Danya for example uh -huh. she's not really going to be a performer probably maybe she is mm -hmm. but she takes a year of improvisation because you can't the only way you can learn improvisation and and how to kind of train your brain to think in this sort of yes and mentalities you just have to do it it's it's one of these it's all kinesthetic you can never learn by someone I can't tell you anything about improvisation, you're going to get it. You need to just get up on your feet and you need to mm -hmm. do scenes. And so they do a year of this improvisation training, but it's all towards the how do you become a storyteller, how do you become a better collaborator, and how do you become a better filmmaker. Hmm. How many? So you rattle off a bunch of stuff. How, how many classes do they take over the year? How many? Do you have a number? Or Six. That? So we're, we divide it up into sessions. Mm -hmm. So we're, we do three sessions for your. That's three sessions a year essentially. Mm -hmm. Each session is six classes. So 18 classes. That's a lot. Man. That's a lot. <laughs> yeah. And then uh, and then, how many projects like films or scripts do the typical student come out with? Yeah. So they, it culminates in a short film that they make. The, the simplest version to talk way to talk about is a festival-ready short, although we don't really like to call it that. But uh -huh. Just a short film that embodies your year uh, and high production value, you know, good cast, mm -hmm. great story. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's all about story and character for mm -hmm. us. Um, and in the filmmaking track, they've they'll have made anywhere between like uh, five and twelve films. Wow. So it's a lot. Yeah. And then uh, either through group projects or individual projects. Um, and then on the writing side, they leave with either a feature screenplay, an hour long pilot with Bible, or a sitcom pilot with Bible. And they'll probably have one or two more of those that have already fully been written. Wow. And then an idea of Bible that they've yeah. created throughout the time. Wow. What, so what what do you think your students want to do? When they graduate, when they're when they're done, I mean, they go to LA. They want to write. They're, they're, what you said, you, you, the word you used earlier was uh, content producer. Yeah. What, what do they want to do? They, 
it's interesting because we are almost exclusively, and I guess some graduate schools do this too, but we aren't training, you know, crew people. Right, right. There's not a single right. DP right. <laughs> at the Harold Ramos right. Film School or a sound guy, although they do it all, you know. we They do learn all that stuff to become dangerous so that mm. they can make their stuff, you know. <laughs> They want to be content creators, and, and so part of it's they want to be the people who are writing, producing, directing, maybe writing, acting, directing, or writing, producing, acting. You know, mm -hmm. they, they want to be in that space. So a lot of people want to be in front of the camera also. I would say probably 40%. Wow. That's a good number. I mean, you know, D Danya talks a lot about Colbert. Yeah. You know, and, and the influences there and even The Daily Show. But, I mean, she's not talking about – she was a little bit about the writing, but I think she was also talking about the performer. Absolutely, and I think the, yeah. the, the, the it's an, there's an exciting energy there because – when you have writer performers and you have maybe people who are like just directors or producers, there's a really great, that all kind of comes together in a good way and actually mirrors my experience. So I went to film school near the end of my film school experience. I had a teacher who told me you should go and take classes at second city. I did. I loved it. And it's changed my life mm -hmm. obviously, because now I'm doing this thing at second city. And I started kind of how I got my start making films right after film school was these writer performers had these great scripts but they had no idea how to make mm -hmm. them. Of course, this is 2006, uh, seven, somewhere in there, yep. eight. And everything was different. And you, the idea of just picking up a camera and shooting it was not really a sure. thing. And you, the iPhone wasn't around. Yep. And YouTube was new. So it's crazy um, to think about. So I would go in and then say, hey, writer, performer, like I'll do this. I'll, I'll, yeah, yeah, I'll produce yeah. this. What I normally did was like, I'll produce this for you. I'll help you make it. And I just want to be able to hire the director. Can mm -hmm. I do that? And I'd be like, yeah. And I'd hire myself <laughs> to direct. Good move. Yeah. So that's how, and so I got to make, that's one of the things that made like my filmmaking kind of experience sort of odd, which is that I, I'm not just a, me personally, I'm not just a director writer, which a lot of people I think are. I, I do it all. And I, I'm, I make as many films that I've not written as, as I do that are written. And that was really lucky for me. And mm -hmm. so the idea of putting all these people together, and that's one of the things that we're trying to do at Harold Ramos too, is we put all these kind of seemingly disparate people together, um, and they build an ensemble. Because filmmaking is the most mm -hmm. collaborative art form yep. that I think that's ever existed. Yep. And film schools also, though I think maybe some of them are starting to come around to this, don't necessarily always do that. I think we're a little bit stuck in auteur theory. We're a little bit stuck in, like, you know, the lone genius. And I think it's more about how do we team create. And that's hard. That's not easy. Yeah. But it's it is what the form actually does in practice. Mm -hmm. yeah, I mean, I, when I think about improvise improvisers as filmmakers, I think of um, Mike Nichols, of sure. course. I think of um, oh, the, the God, I'm blanking on his name. The English guy, Mike Lee. Uh, Mike Lee, thanks. Mm -hmm. All the mics, yeah, all, all Mike. the mics are good. They're yeah. all improv guys. But but Cassavetes, you're not, you're not of course Cassavetes. But but you're not you're you're not training them that way, right? I mean, or are you? Right? Uh, you mean in terms of the How, Mike Lee process? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Where they, so, yeah. my personal belief is that there's no one way to make films. That's probably not a huge, like, revelatory statement. What we're going to teach you is a process. Mm -hmm. Actually, we're going to try and teach you many processes. And I think what we want in the year for you to leave with is a, it, it might be too much to ask for them to know what their process is, but to be on the path towards what their process is, or have made yeah. some decisions about how they want to make yeah. decisions. How happen. they like to work and the kind of people they like to work with, exactly. I'm guessing. Yeah. I think what you find with a lot of young people and people who are trying to, maybe not necessarily young people, but maybe young to the craft, because we have people in the program. The other thing that's cool is that we have people who are in their 40s, 50s, 60s, mingling oh. with 24-year-olds. Wow. And what that does to the dynamic is very sure. interesting. Sure. So people who are new to the craft is they... And this is probably true of all art, is they want someone to be like, am I doing it right? Is there a right answer <laughs> yeah, to this? Yeah. <laughs> and the thing that we always fight against is that there's no right answer. Of course, yeah. And one of the things that we have at Second City at Harold Ramos Film School, though that is comforting, is a process. And that's kind of the Second City process and a way of approaching problems. And that's comforting because people are like, okay, now I know how to approach a problem yeah. now through this training. Um, it might not necessarily get you, you know, the outcome doesn't necessarily guarantee good art, but at least gives you a process. And I mm -hmm. think the challenge is finding out what are those processes that work for you. You said a moment ago that when you were at film school, a teacher suggested you go to Second City and take classes. Uh, why? It was not you. I know. <laughs> <laughs> why? Why? And for a long time, though, I screened uh, your film mm -hmm. Tells, you know, because it's yeah. great visual storytelling. Yeah. Um, Thanks. I... Um, uh, so why did you get a suggestion to go to Columbia uh, to Second City, and why did you what what did you learn there that changed your life? Yeah. So Falzone, Ron Falzone was my mm -hmm. teacher, directing one in that class. When they ran it, we did the Heidi Chronicles and American Buffalo. It was a little bit 
it was a while ago. So we were doing stage plays to learn text analysis mm-hmm. and character and directing actors and all that. And the way that they ran it was, I feel like you could never run classes like this anymore. They, um, <laughs> if you didn't, you had to stage scenes in class. Mm-hmm. Just stage in almost the that stage. Yeah, sure. Not, I remember that no class. Film. Yeah. yeah, yeah. They've changed that now, I think. Um, and if you didn't stage a scene, your actor bailed. You weren't ready, etc. Yeah. You got an F for the project. Yeah. So a student, a, a classmate of mine, uh, you know, his actor bailed on a mammoth scene for American Buffalo. He asked me to step in. I did. We did it. I We basically didn't it rehearse at all. We improvised our way through it. And, you know, if you throw enough F-bombs and <laughs> mammoth, you're getting pretty close, you know. And so afterwards, they're like, how many rehearsals did you have? I was like, well, none. It's like, well, how is that? You know, we just kind of made it up. I'm like, well, you did really well. And so they're like, maybe you should you, – you're pretty good at thinking on your feet. Mm-hmm. And I think they just saw how I was probably normally attacking problems and sort of my general mm, inclinations. And they said, you should take, you should just go. And I was like, yeah, I'll do that. That sounds cool. Uh, and then what I liked about Second City, geez, that's a good one. I mean, it just changes, it, it completely changes the way you look at it. So it, 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 the way we look at it, and I found it actually really did relate to filmmaking, mm-hmm. is that we don't, I don't really have the word problem is not necessarily in my vocabulary it's uh, it's opportunity mm-hmm. like uh, any perceived challenge you take and turn into a strength it's mm-hmm. almost like right, right, sure. judo it's like yeah. you t- how do you take the person's weight and use it against them mm-hmm. so that's filmmaking i mean you come here we go okay you get to your location your location for some reason bailed on you everyone's here the actors are here you've spent you you know what do you do yeah. go on the street yeah you go on yeah. the street you yeah. do whatever yeah. and so many people don't do that though they're yeah. just like well can't you know, do anything now. Can't do anything now. We'll go home. Exactly. Yeah. This yeah. isn't exactly what I thought. And yeah. it's like, well, that's – and so I think that started to kind of come together. And I, so I think we sometimes think a little bit one-dimensionally when we think about improvised movies where it's like – and I've done that, you know, in terms of that, like with the close quarters and open tables where it's like they're improvising on camera. But there's also a methodology of improvisation that permeates every single part of my now my process. And so, you know, one of the things that they do on the main stage at Second City is they – you know, a show is created by – through the third act of the improv set, they start to put up material in front of an audience and they get that reaction. And then mm-hmm. the show that you see is built off of them live failing, mm-hmm. essentially, like mm-hmm. things that don't work. And so I've started to integrate that into my entire filmmaking process. So for 42 Grams, is, is, for example, the documentary I made that just came out, I did 15 screenings of it from the earliest rough cut that mm-hmm. when I think about screening, it makes me cringe because <laughs> it was so bad. Yeah. But I was getting up in front of people as early as possible. What are you responding to? What are yep. you not responding to? Because that's, I mean, it's all about the audience. Sure, you right. want them to enjoy your film. And so you have this kind of feedback loop. And, and you, you know, you need the luxury of time to do that. I mean, mm-hmm. you, can, you, can't, you can't do that if you've got a hard deadline of Friday. <laughs> you know? No, that's hard. I mean, it, or, you know, some, a, a TV series, you know, a weekly series, you know, they just don't have the right. time. Longer form things, films and stuff can, can do that. What, one of the things I think a lot of, artists do is they have to figure out their voice. Mm-hmm. You know, I think, you know, you, you don't know what your voice is until you actually start having a voice, Correct. right? And and if you're young, you've just been influenced by a whole bunch of people. Mm-hmm. And, and that's that's really interesting. So how did the Harold Ramis Film School start? I mean, it, I mean, it had something to do with him besides his name, I think, right? Yeah. So we were doing classes at Second City and we just noticed that there was in the TV film digital space and we realized that there was just a kind of class of people or a section of people who are just like they wanted more. And so we started to explore this, like, what if we offered a longer, more in-depth program? And then with Harold, Harold's experience and his life kind of mimics generally what we wanted to be messaging out or kind of what we saw this happening is that this is a person who started on stage, on the stage as an improviser, and then shifted into acting, you know, more traditional acting, and then kind of shifted into writing and directing and doing all the above. And so that kind of is what we're saying is like Second City as a whole is like, yeah, you know us from being the main stage and from mm-hmm. the, the, the actors that we create. And we actually we actually have a good tradition of people who have gone on to have success in the film space. Yeah. So this is more just like seeing what's already there and, and trying to just yes and it. And, mm-hmm. you know, it's like we started in, in the, on the stage and, and we're making it here. And so Harold Rams Film School kind of embodies that transition from only thinking about us as this sort of stage thing Mm -hmm. um, and coming into this other mode of film. I mean, Second City, and I'm not asking you to speak for the Second City, but they also have their 
uh, you know, corporate sort of side of things and other parts of the, of the business. Oh, yeah. It's not, I mean, I think for a long time, everyone thought it was just shows. Yes. You know, you, you know, th those improv shows, but I think it's a natural sort of outgrowth of what you guys do over there. Uh, yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think so. And I think that, yeah, there's a number of different divisions. One is the, the, yeah, those, the shows, and then one is the, the business stuff. And then there's like filmmaking side. And then there's now Harold Ramis film school. Right. What, what, uh, what are goals for the school longer term? I mean, you could, in theory, I'm just floating things out there. You could have other campuses, other places. I mean, LA, Toronto, whatever. I mean, what, what are the goals? I don't know. It's funny because we actually, when we started, we were thinking about other campuses. And now I'm not sure. It's an incredible, people want to be at Second City. Yeah. They want to be in. Like, it's nice when you go in there and your yeah. facility is fantastic, right? Facility is fantastic. Yeah. People really just want to be close to like, the main stage. I mean, it's weird. The energy in the building is, mm -hmm. it's impossible to replicate. And I've been to the other locations. The other locations are great and they have their own cool energy about them. But it's weird because we are so much more than just this, I would say the two stages would be main stage and ETC. But also they are really absolutely at the core. It's like the heart. It's like, I don't know, mm -hmm. the Blarney Stone or something like that. I'm trying to think <laughs> of what it would be. It's like that in the energy. The epicenter. That yeah, it's the epicenter. Yeah. And, and the energy that radi radiates out from that and the protection that the ownership and all of the producers and all of the creatives have around making sure that this process that they do on the main stage in ETC is protected from everything mm -hmm. um, is like pure artistically good. Mm -hmm. And I think that kind of radiates out from there. And so just being in the space and being close to that energy, mm -hmm. I mean, it sounds really like weird, but I, I, it's unless you've yeah, been no, in course, right. Second City, it's hard to kind of explain it, the attitude that you just get being there. Mm -hmm. And that at the end of the day, when it when push comes to shove or a decision needs to be made, the fact that every single person in that building is going to come to a moment of like thinking back to this sort of core tenets of improvisation and the core tenets of like yes and and ensemble and all that. The fact that at the end of the day, like when we were met with even a financial decision, it's like, okay, this is still factoring into it. That permeates everything and that is very special. And so although we like the idea of like global global takeover, I think now it's a little <laughs> bit looped back around to keeping it small. Keeping it keeping it tight, keeping in, it small and yeah, getting people in, in the, those doors. In those doors. It makes great sense. I mean, because I think the classic problem is people growing too fast and all that kind of stuff. Absolutely. How many students do you have to total right now? We have seventy three currently in school. We've graduated 45, wow. 46, 46. Great. So, and and that, so when's the next start for you guys? Fall. So we have uh, September-ish or something like yeah, that? Yeah, so we will take applic application deadline, I think, is end of May of this year. So in, uh, from when this airs, I guess, uh, two months, uh, yeah. Rob out, I think. Yeah. Um, and then classes start just after Labor Day, I yeah. believe. What, you, you said at the beginning it's a rigorous application process. What, what, mm -hmm. what, what do they have to do? They have to do... Um, Essay, they have to do a work sample, although it's important to know that the work sample doesn't have to be a film. Um, our favorite one, we always talk about it, is like a woman who went to a school for jazz composition and she submitted a song that she wrote. And what made it happen wasn't necessarily that that song was amazing or bad. It was just fine, but it was her work description. She talks about her intention, so it's about intentionality. Uh -huh. A couple letters of reference, a writing sample, doesn't have to be scripted. Ideally, I actually <clears throat> prefer it not to necessarily be a script, just something that shows your ability to write and tell mm -hmm. a story. And then a cover letter video, so two, two to three minutes sort of thing that you talk about yourself. And that can be as simple as just you on an iPhone, mm -hmm. you, know, re you know, reverse camera thing, or one of the first group of students ed his his entry video was one of the best short films i've ever seen <laughs> you know and it was just his entry video into the program you hmm. know so you can get very creative yeah. or just sort of be like hey, straightforward on me yeah. i don't know how to work cameras because yeah. we don't care about camera we don't yeah. teach you how to do any of the camera stuff we yeah. don't care about cameras and editing too right you don't have an editing class no right? yeah I mean, that's a really interesting approach. And I think you're kind of right. I think there are some grad schools that are sort of like, we're, we're going for this kind of yeah. graduate and alumni. I mean, we, we are, we'll never, we might, we're, we kind of keep on exploring like an extra semester or an extra thing here or an extra thing there. But almost by the nature of the fact that we're one year, it comes down to really, it's very simple in the end. Well, I have one year with you. And although that seems like it's a lot of time, it's it goes almost nothing. Fast. Yeah. And if I have this much class time with you, I'm not going to spend it on gear. Yeah. Yeah. I'm going to spend it on story. Yeah. Ideas. Character, yeah. Relationship, ideas, and your intention. Yeah. Because that's the stuff that 
you can actually you need guidance on you need support yep. you need feedback you need all that stuff the gear stuff is is slightly just one directional yeah there's not a lot of dialogue that can happen on like yeah. menu settings of a camera yeah and and they've got to get their hands on it and just do it and play and with our, it or bring someone in to do it exactly you know? and yeah. then both of those are totally fine i mean yeah. some some people are like, I don't really like cameras. I'm like, great. Yep. Yeah. That, 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 I mean, that would be a relief for a whole lot of people. I mean, I'm serious. <laughs> yeah. You know, I, I, I'm i an idea guy. I don't want to touch the thing. Yeah. I mean, I'm what, but I want to see what happens in Absolutely. front of it. Yeah. And, and there's actually a virtuous cycle that can happen there because everyone who's not the writer, director, producer, who's not the content creator needs content to shoot, mm -hmm. roll sound for, mm -hmm. set up lights, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So it's like, that's how it works. Like we need people who have the ideas. We need people who can, can execute the ideas. Mm. And I think it's just sort of embracing that. Mm -hmm. what, I, we haven't said it, but what, what's tuition? It's right now 17500 any for any, a year. Any scholarship there's, break or anything? There is yeah. scholarship through yeah. the Ramus family. They have a memorial fund. Nice. Um, which has nothing to do with the school. You have to apply and they kind of deal with it on their own. So, yeah. Cool. And then you have a, we have a, I think it's, oh, man, I hope I'm right on this. I think it's a 16-month payback. So from when you start, you have essentially 16 months to to do that. Oh, that's good. Yeah. Yeah, good. Um, so now just about you. What, uh, 42 grams, what, what else are you working on well, film-wise? So 42 Grams documentary, we did a, that just came to Netflix early February. So that's great. A um, bunch of festivals and it's getting out there. Documentary. Um, I'm in post-production right now on a docu-series uh, about my, the product, the project's called How to Build a School in Haiti. And I've been working on that since 2011. Wow. And it's about the construction of a school in rural, rural Haiti. Wow. Uh, and post-hurricane? Uh, post-earthquake, yeah. yeah earthquake, yeah. It's yeah. okay. Because they also had a uh, hurricane. Yeah. Um, and it's we follow one school's construction. So it's essentially a single aid project in rural Haiti from an NGO, an American, um, a couple of Americans basically who decided to help them build this school. And it starts as they meet with the community, as they start to build it, as they build it, and as they open the school. And so it's sort of like wow. a bird's eye view of one single project and using that to kind of have a conversation about international economic aid. So super interesting amazing in terms of character i mean the arcs we have are, are unbelievable like we got the access we got we were really lucky with and so we're in the process of putting that together now and i we're thinking it's going to be a docu-series that's what we're cutting for so wow. we're putting that together and then um in terms of film stuff you know up for a couple of projects here and there that you just kind of get yeah. you you know who knows and then raising money for the next uh fiction film that wow. i want to make you're a busy guy Try to be. You gotta be. You gotta be right. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Gotta have a lot of stuff to do. Well, this has been great. Thank you. I really appreciate it. Anything you want to add about the Held Ramus? No, I don't think so. No, it's great. Yeah, I think it's it's a really cool program, and it's very unique in a lot of ways. And I think that in the in years to come, you're going to start to see more programs like this because Good. of our agility and our flexibility and what we can do in terms of that. And when you're just talking about the film space. Obviously, education is important and like getting the degree and all mm -hmm. that is very, very, very important. I think everyone should go to school. But mm -hmm. as you know, like. Yeah. I mean, I think you're right. I mean, I think that, that for this thing, there's there's nothing wrong. This isn't vocational training. This is enhancement. This is, right. you know, f f shaping artists, yeah. you know. And I mean, you're, you're an artist and you're right. shaping artists. I think that's terrific. Right. And, you know, in a minute, D Danya's going to share, you know, the student experience. So right. we're going to get the whole. Hopefully I set her up well. I think you did. <laughs> Great. All right. Thanks, Jack. That's it. That's it with Jack. Thank you, Jack. I really appreciate it. Really interesting. And good luck with all your projects as well. Um, up next is a graduate of the Harold Ramis Film School, Danya Khan. Really, really interesting conversation with her. She left um, a, uh, a, a safe student gig at the University of Texas nearing completion to leave uh, and come to Chicago for the first time and go to the Harold Ramis Film School. And as she talks about it, uh, she was really influenced by Second City and sketch comedy, and we talk about Colbert and The Daily Show and other things like that. And um, she really uses her own background and her, her faith uh, in her work, and she's funny and a, a firecracker, and I really enjoyed talking to her. And here is my conversation with Danya Khan. So, Danya Khan, welcome. Thank you for having me. I'm happy to be here. So, so you were a Harold Ramis Film School graduate. You are yes. a Harold Ramis Film School graduate. Yes. Were you in the first class? Or? I was. Wow. Yeah. So that's great. So, so tell me a little bit about the film school. I, I know a lot of people over there. I've been there. Great space. But you know, tell me about the school. It's very cool. 
Um, it's very focused on writing and finding your comedic voice and what that means in today's landscape. Um, so classes as vague as reference building. So knowing where improv started, how satire functions in society and things like that. So you'll have classes like that paired with lighting classes and sound classes and workshops and uh, brainstorming classes. It's really kind of an incubator of creativity. It's very cool in that an, way. An incubator. So it, a year, it's a year-long program? It is. Yeah. It's a full year, so like three terms if you would put it in the semester. Yeah. And and how, how many like hours a week or days a week were you in there? I mean, it was at least like 20 cl- hours of classes a week, oh. something like that. Pretty, so, pretty immersive. Yeah, for yeah. sure. It's like straight up college yeah. at that point as far as how many classes you're taking and then time outside of class that is spent there is... I don't know, incalculable at this point. Sure, of course. Yeah, there yeah. very often. Yeah. So so what made you decide to go there? Um, it was, was a new program. It was. It was brand new. There was no precedent. It was a dumb <laughs> 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 win. No, it wasn't that. Um, I was studying at the University of Texas at Austin, and I was a double major in film and Middle Eastern politics. <laughs> and Because <laughs> they go hand in hand, <laughs> obviously. And... You know, it was, I was just very bored there. Mm-hmm. Um, I was always the kind of person that if I wanted to learn something, I would just pick up a book and figure it out. Mm-hmm. And so class just felt like test taking. And so I was pretty set on dropping out or taking a gap year or something in that mind frame. And all my comedic heroes are from Second City. Obviously, everyone has heard the names a hundred times over. And I was interested in just being a part of that lineage in some way, shape or form. So my goal was to drop out, move to Chicago, and take an improv class. The day that I dropped out from the university, they announced the film school, and I was like, oh, (laughs) serendipity is beckoning. Go, go. So I applied and worked on my essay for just way too long, you know, just putting all my my eggs in that one basket. And um, luckily I got in and... I was like, all right, this is what you're doing now. So wow. That's kind of how that so let's go back but before you get there. Where, where sure. are you from? Houston, Texas. So so going to UT in Austin made some sense. I right. Guess. It's like yeah. the schools that you go to in the t- greater Texas area or whatever, either Aggies or Longhorns, uh-huh. you know. So. <laughs> UT has a good film program. I mean, yeah. it's been there forever. I mean, I, I, uh, a guy who hired me once upon a time ran that film program, the oh, production yeah? department, Ira Abrams, you know, years ago. And they had a program there called Burnt Orange, which uh, they made, um, they, they sort of made films for hire. Uh, oh, you know, okay. they did that for a long time. Yeah. Um, but so, and then had you been to Chicago before? I had not. Wow. It was just a completely like blind move. I was so sick of university <laughs> and I just wanted anything different. My mom and dad were pissed. Um, still are kind of like a year and a half out. They're still like, when are you going back to college? Yeah. Um, how, how much college did you have before you dropped out? I would have been in my senior year. Wow. Had I stayed. You're really near the end. <laughs> right. <laughs> well, have you thought about going back? I consider it, but it just, I'm, I'm kind of waiting to fail uh-huh. at film before mm-hmm. I <laughs> make the trek back to university. Well, one of the things I really believe in, I, I, I'm, I'm glad you're doing what you're doing. I mean, you, you, you weren't going to get anywhere if you didn't change paths, Mm -hmm. you know, and you're young and you can change. And like you said, fail fast. I like the idea of failing fast. I mean, fail fast, make a mistake, learn from those mistakes and do something different. Right. And I think that's a really good philosophy to have. But, you know, you were brave. You know, that was that was that was bold. You had never been here. You knew you were going to get some some backlash from your parents, Uh, brothers and sisters. I have two siblings, an older brother and an older sister. Were they supportive? They, my brother is just very cool and could like care less, you know, he doesn't (laughs) care at all what I'm doing. Um, and, and he lives in New York and he's a journalist. Mm -hmm. So he's like, yeah, right. Closer to the arts. Right. Pretty close to the arts. And my sister's an architect, also very close to the arts. Um, I think journalist and architect just sound more prestigious. So Mm -hmm. it was like very cool at the house, whereas filmmaking sounds very like, it's prestigious to me. It's prestigious <laughs> to me as well. I think I have immigrant parents and they're mm-hmm. like, what is Hollywood? It's a lie. <laughs> so they were not as like into it and still are like, you're just going to make movies. What kind of a career is that? You know, and um, I've, I've managed to to come up with some pretty fun arguments against them. But 
Uh, my my big sister is like my my rock. She supports nice. me nonstop. That's great. Mm-hmm. So so you said you know you loved Second City, but you had never been there right before. Who were some of your comedic influences? I mean, Second City's got a huge. I mean, you could right. go way back to Mike Nichols, or you mm-hmm. could be really current. You Who know, I so, love, Mike yeah. Nichols is a genius, mm-hmm, and, of course, and yeah. um, Elaine May as well. Uh, I think. I learned about them later. Like mm-hmm. once I got to Second City, I didn't know who they. I yeah, had seen the graduate, and, but yeah. that that name didn't matter to me yeah. at the time. Um, and so that's part of the education at Second City or at the Harold Ramis Film School is that they you learn about who these people are, mm-hmm. which is a huge help now. But um, my my greatest comedic influences growing up was like John Stewart and Stephen Colbert. Um, though John Stewart did not go to Second City, yeah. Colbert Colbert's certainly did. did. Yeah. Yeah. And I had always felt a very close kinship to Colbert because he was so Catholic and so like into right. his religion while also being very outright about everything mm-hmm. and devout at the same time. That was very appealing to me as someone from a very strict-ish religion <laughs> mm-hmm. um, to be like, no, you can do it all. Like you can have it all. It's wow. fine. Um, so I always really, really looked up to him. Um, Carell is a huge one, mm-hmm. of course, and Tina Fey, Amy Poehler, all those guys, you know, in the in the Mike Schur lineage as yeah. well that I've that I'm obsessed with. Um, all those guys are just brilliant. What What made you think you could do this? I mean, I don't say that in, no, in a snarky absolutely. way. But I mean, are, are you funny? <laughs> wow, <laughs> <laughs> can't you tell? Um, no, I I'm not terribly funny, and. Out of my class, I'm probably the least funny, outright at least. Mm-hmm. My writing's okay, but I'm not the funniest person. I think what I always wanted to be a filmmaker. Well, maybe not always. Why? I always <laughs> I, I love my TV raised me, mm-hmm. I think. You know, my mom and dad are such hardworking people, mm-hmm. like always working. My dad, I would see him maybe on Sunday. What, what's he do? My dad, um, growing up, he worked at like a Burger King mm. and then, you know, just and gas stations and has worked his way up to owning his own franchise now. So he's very successful now, but growing up it was, you know, kind of a difficult childhood as far as the financial state was concerned. And my mom, she worked at like a Macy's and a Pally Royal or whatever kind of department store was around until she finally got into the healthcare industry. And Mm -hmm. so now she's an office manager at a um, internal medicine clinic. Hmm. And so, you know, very hardworking people who left me with my brother and sister at home all the time, and all we did was watch TV. Hmm. So I was like, oh, that's awesome. That's cool. These... What, what were some of the shows or movies? Oh, man, they're embarrassing. That's they're what... very bad. Yeah. It's like Disney Channel that's and like, a... yeah. <laughs> things like that. So um, a lot uh, of a lot of Fresh Prince of Bel-Air, a lot of Cosby show before that was yeah. taboo to say out yeah, loud. You know, but the, hey, those guys, those shows were written by like Harvard graduates. Right. You know, it's like, I mean, you know, Lampoon folks, you know, mm-hmm. there at Harvard and, and uh, Tasty, uh, you know, Pudding. And those are smart, smart guys. Conan O'Brien. Absolutely. I mean, right. um, Love Colbert. the Simpsons growing yes. up. Yes, like, oh, the Simpsons are all the Harvard guys. All geniuses. Yeah, yeah. And so, and so, th- th- there's nothing you know saying they're I'm silly saying shows. I'm saying the cool ones. Yeah. <laughs> but I'm. <laughs> I also watch like That's So Raven and Hannah Montana and all that crap. But you were uh, young. I was. Yeah. Uh, and now it's all gone. So, so how does that work? And you know, Carell and Colbert and those guys. How does that filter Come down in. to you? Yeah. I think once. Because I'm a Muslim American. Once 9-11 happened, Jon Stewart was like a prophet, <laughs> you know? He was like, hey, you can be a person. And that was so liberating to me. Um, he he was always very, like, he wasn't terribly biased, obviously, like, talking about things like terrorism and all that's, like, very difficult because there's so many stereotypes involved and so many so much bigotry involved in the rhetoric that it's so hard to find a place to exist within that. And when you have guys who are just laughing at the talking heads, it's it's like catharsis, mm-hmm. you know. Mm-hmm. So that's where my love for John Stewart and Stephen Colbert really began to flourish was when they were making fun of all the idiots on CNN to Fox, yeah, yeah. you know, all of them. Yeah. And that was awesome. I, I think that those shows when they were on back to back were more about the media than about politics Absolutely, and, and yeah. poking fun at the, the media covering politics yeah. as much as anything else and the hypocrisy. Right. John Stewart's big thing was about like the contrived urgency created yeah. by 
the new system and I and I you know 1984 is like my favorite book too huh. so like the correlation of him explaining that to me in the terms that I had already understood from Orwell mm -hmm. was like oh we live in an Orwellian society sure. and um media really has a lot of power yeah but you are a serious person <laughs> you know so 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 okay so this is filtering down I'm so super funny though can you tell <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so so w when you when you were young did you i'm mean, high school or that age did you make film with the, you know a video camera or friends i was not the super 8 kid yeah? at all i wish i had the foresight i couldn't afford a camera ever and I, my mom was like you get a flip phone which is fair mm -hmm. at that time and yeah, yeah. age smartphones were like crazy well they're crazy expensive now but for a seven-year-old or whatever it's absurd um so no i didn't do much of that i did a ton of like i did marching band so i was on like i did like drumline stuff mm -hmm. and then um i was in theater so i did a lot of musical theater oh. growing up um huge on musical theater like obnoxious fan so when did you say to yourself or someone say to you hey Go into the film business or try this. I mean, it's, I mean, everyone has a slightly different story, yeah. but what, what's your story? For me, it was like, I wanted to be like an actress. I wanted to be like In a front singer. Of the camera, yeah. yeah uh -huh. Now I'm like, that's dumb. Don't ever do that. <laughs> but uh, before I was like very into myself and, and the idea of performing. And um, I think that I was like, how can I figure out a way into the industry where it sounds prestigious enough for my family so that they're not terribly embarrassed? And it's something where I can get my creative outlet out. And I was kind of like a, a jack of all trades, master of none mm -hmm. type person where I did music and writing and, and film was just like a culmination of all the things that I really love to do. So it seemed like a no brainer mm. um, at that point. So that's kind of how I came to that that realization mm. but that was late in life that was like graduating high school yeah. 18 late 18 in life. yeah well late in life for <laughs> yeah, yeah. the kids that are yeah. running around sure. with their cameras yeah. at age the seven the spielbergs of you know when he was a kid right and all those, those nerds guys. yeah yeah jj yeah. <laughs> abrams all mm -hmm. those guys yeah I, I i agree what um so so you, you what was the first work you did was it when you were still at texas or not until you came to chicago it was in texas yeah i worked on like a like a short film for a it was like a Muslim competition and there was like a film category. And I was like, okay, well, let me try my hat on that. So I made a very, very bad short film that won first, but the bar was very low <laughs> in all fairness. <laughs> so it was, uh, it was like a short film about um, how we pick and choose where our sympathies go, you know, when, mm -hmm. when there's a crisis and how, you know, we should all be in it together and not... Um, pick which countries will support as far as what is devastating to us, and it was, it was bad. But <laughs> that's what it was kind of about. Well, I mean, you go up from there. I mean, right. I, you certainly hope your first film isn't your best film. Right. You, know, you hope you improve and improve, and you learned a lot, I'm sure, from the process. Absolutely. And you then had to show it to people, right. and you probably felt kind of uncomfortable showing it to people. It's, it's like this horrible, like gnawing sensation at your heart, you know, when you show someone something. <laughs> I, I don't know. I mean, I've been doing that now for 35 years or so. I don't know if I'm ever comfortable with yeah. it. I mean, it's yeah. I'm more comfortable than I used to be, but mm -hmm. it's hard. You know, Definitely. it's a piece of you that you're giving up. You yeah. know? So did you, so now you want to be writer, director, no more in ideally, front of the camera? Ideally, ideally. Uh -huh. I mean... Like, I've been in front of the camera just because it's so hard to cast, sure. <laughs> like, brown people. Yeah. It's been possibly the biggest challenge I've had being a filmmaker here in Chicago is casting um, and just trying to get a brown family that somewhat yeah. is passable as a family. So, so I saw the, the trailer to your project. Yes. Uh, what's, what's it called? I'm Undercover. Sorry. Undercover. Yeah. What, so so you've got to have a brown family there. How'd you find him? I have kind of a brown family. It's <laughs> so the, the two girls are, they play sisters and luckily they are sisters. So mm -hmm. that was yeah, a huge, you really huge help. See, feel it. Yeah. Oh my gosh. That was so big when I found them, but the way that I found them was insane. So I had been searching in Chicago for upwards of like six months at that point. And I finally called my mom and was like, do you know anyone who lives in Chicago? Please help me. And she goes, well, my sister-in-law has a cousin who lives in Chicago. And I was like, okay, freaking give me her number, dude. And 
Um, so my mom gives me her number and I call her and I send her like a whole like explanation of what the short film is and I email her back and forth and finally she's like, okay, well I have a friend who might know someone who has daughters who kind of like to act. Wow. And I was like, fantastic. <laughs> that is the greatest news I've ever heard. <laughs> And so I, I met them, and they're the sweetest girls, and I've cast them, and so we're moving forward with them. But I, you've seen the the clip. The yeah. mother is way too young, so mm -hmm. she needs yeah. to be recast. Yeah. And um, I'm in that process now as well of what, like— What are you doing for casting? How, how, does, how does a young filmmaker in Chicago f cast people? Call your mom. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> uh, I definitely—I've been doing like backstage, all backstage, that kind of, of stuff. Course, yeah. uh, the Second City has a great just like— um, like for the Harold Ramis Film School students, they've created a database yeah. of actors that we have access to, which is really great. Unfortunately, our world functions in a binary, so it's black and white, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> race-wise as well. So it's so hard to find South Asian actors, especially people who can play parents. Yeah. Like, come on. Wow. I'm asking for the moon here. Wow. <laughs> yeah, that, like. yeah, sure. But yeah. but I mean that's that's what's actually gonna set you apart. I you hope know, so. people yeah. people will recognize how hard it was how hard it is and how hard it was for you to do it. And it's so, you know, I've seen two things. I, I saw the, the piece you did for school, mm -hmm. sort of the takeoff on uh, La La Land, mm -hmm. right? And then I saw the trailer. Mm -hmm. And, and you know, you have your own, especially in the trailer when it's clearly your voice, you know, you're, you, you don't, you're not doing an assignment. Right. You have a vision. You know what the st kinds of stories you want to tell. So tell us. Tell, I'm the only one in, sure, uh, who knows, knows this. What's going yeah. On. <laughs> so, so, so tell us about Undercover. I will fill and, you and, guys in. Yes, and what you want to do. Sure. So, Undercover is a short film that's kind of based on an experience I had growing up um, about a young Muslim girl wanting to join a gospel choir. So, like I said, I was big in musical <laughs> theater, love singing, still love singing. Um, so it's a story based on that idea, and. Um, how she has to like sneak out to join the choir and um, it, a huge play on like gospel robes and like Muslim attire as well. And that's where the title comes into play. Um, and this project has been something I've been working on for almost a year. We're looking to finally shoot it first week of April. So mm. coming up soon. Um, how long is the script? The script is about 10, 10 to 12 pages, uh -huh. roughly. Yeah. And, Still being edited. <laughs> and and, and are, are you working with um, what kind of budget do you have, and how are you shooting so it? So we did stuff? an Indiegogo, mm, and good. we raised money. Uh, we raised five thousand to do it, which is like a ton of money yeah. for a short film, which is great. Um, I've completely like redone my apartment to look like a home. So mm -hmm. and that's been such a cool thing to try and do is how do you make something so familiar to yourself? filmic and mm -hmm. stylized mm -hmm. that's been such a fun you're project. doing it all yourself you're not using a production totally designer or myself a yeah, yeah painting my sister again is an architect and so um she has a huge design background so she's been helping uh, my dream in life is to have a production company with my sister oh, sweet. um kind of like a cohen brothers but a con sisters <laughs> you know like a little cute brown muslim yeah, yeah, version yeah. <laughs> <laughs> to the jewish code brothers. um so we've been working, and this will be our first like big production as the Con Sisters. So that's wow, a... that's great! She's here local, also. She's not. She's oh. in Houston, so she's working remotely. She's oh. come down or up to Chicago a few times, um, and will be here for the production as well. So you want you want to shoot in six weeks or so? It's, yeah, yeah, yeah. So um, are you gonna? So the trailer was completely separate, and you're right. recasting the mom there, but you're keeping right. the girls. Yes. Okay. Yeah. How many? What's the total cast? The total cast, well, we have a gospel choir, so we're looking at about like a 20 person cast. Wow. Um, and all the, st everybody who's working on it um, has been someone that's been per like I've met at Second City or mm -hmm. has, you know, come from that yeah. little group. So your DP and right, editor and stuff. Yeah. Right. Everyone, yeah. well, a, a few of them weren't students there, but they're people I've met through students there. Mm -hmm. So that's kind of how that came into fruition. Um, so yeah, I mean, there's still, I still have so much to figure out. Sure. It's ruining my life, Peter. <laughs> how, 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 how can I help? I, I ask students that all the time. How can sure, I help? What yeah. Can I, I need yeah. locations. I need actors. No, um, we're figuring it out slowly, yeah. but surely. Do you have a producer? 
I do. I'm the producer on it, which is the yeah, worst. Well, and my advice would be get bring producer. someone else. Yeah, because yeah, yeah because the the writer director in you is going to fight the producer in you, right. and someone's going to lose. Right. Absolutely. So just someone who you know, it's not like get necessarily giving them the checkbook, mm-hmm. but you know, here, here's I would a, love to. Yeah. I would. <laughs> I'm so willing to just hand over the money to someone else and be like, I'll be there on the day to shoot. We're all good. Produ- like producing is possibly the bane of my existence. What do you have an assistant director? I do have an assistant okay. director. Maybe maybe you could bump that person right. up a little yeah. bit. Just just because what's going to happen is at some point, um, you you as writer director are going to be working and really into the scene you're doing, and at some point it's going to be lunch, mm-hmm. <laughs> and and they're going to sit there and say, well, you know, Danya, we got to break for lunch, and you don't want to, and mm-hmm. if you're the one person who says I have to break for lunch and I want to keep going, right. it's you know, too much. it's too much. It's absolutely, too and much. then just other decisions. You know, you you just can't be objective Absolutely. about it. So I it's, strongly it's, encourage you to find someone. It's so hard to find a good team, you know. like Maybe I know people. Maybe, yeah. <laughs> I think it's been a goal of mine to get mostly uh, people of color and minorities and first-generation folks working on this. Not as a—not just, you know, for, for fun, but um, I, I, there's like a— I don't want to like shit on white people. That's not what I'm here to do. But I've we've worked on this film a little bit, and there's just like a level of disconnect sure. for a lot of people sure. that aren't used to having yeah. to to have minority parents or what that what that's like. And at the point where people are doing multiple jobs, you really want that level of understanding sure. from everyone. Uh, you're not going to get any argument from me. And mm-hmm. I mean, look at Spike Lee. You mm-hmm. know, I mean, Spike Lee's crews are, you know. African American and from Brooklyn, and mm-hmm. it's a community, especially in his early films. I mean, it was Absolutely, a community, yeah. and it, they, you have a shorthand. So, mm-hmm. you know, I, do, I made a note. You know, maybe I do know some folks. I mean, I've been around film schools for a long time, Please, in Chicago yeah. film schools. I'll take and, all the help I can and, get. <laughs> and, and especially the project's interesting. You're going to get some press on it. I mean, you're going to get a little bit here, and, and Thank her, you. you know, um, Harold Ramis Film School will push it out and all that kind of stuff. Uh, how, how, many, how many shooting days? Like three? Three. Yeah. Three shooting yeah, days. Long weekend. What are you shooting on? Do you know? Um, we're shooting on a C three hundred. That's good. Yeah. yeah, that's good. And you've got an editor. We that, do. Yeah, yeah that's mm-hmm. good. Um, so you make this film and then f- festival route. What are you going to do? Yeah, that's the that's the goal. Yeah. If it, if it gets that good. <laughs> right now, it's just at the point of like I just want to make it and get it out and do the best work on it that I can. Mm-hmm. Learn from it as much as I can. You will. And then, if it's film festival worthy. Absolutely. Well, you, well, you know, you've got to get it out there. You Absolutely, know, you've got to, yeah. You know, I mean, there, you I will mean find... it'll hit Facebook and my mom and dad for sure. You know, yeah, they'll yeah. see it. <laughs> well, I mean, that's really important. It, you know, even if it is flawed, and I hope it isn't, and you hope it isn't, you've got to show it to people. Mm-hmm. You've got to go through that experience. Right. So you've got to finish the cycle uh, mm-hmm. of it. So, so okay, say that's, even if it's a minor success, it gets into a festival or two mm-hmm. and, you know, there are a whole bunch of festivals these right. days. I mean, you can find someplace that's going to screen sure. it. And, and YouTube, of course, and Facebook, you've got all these venues that, that you know, I didn't have back then. Mm-hmm. What, what, what's the next step? What do you want to do after that? My Okay, the dream. Mm-hmm. Here's the dream scenario. Make a dope ass short film, <laughs> go into film festivals, and they're like, "Danya, that was amazing. What else do you have?" And I'll be yeah. like, "I've written these features." Well, yeah, so you have written features? I or, have, yeah. Oh, great! Yeah, and so. they're comedies. They are comedies, a little bit um, more mature than the short film, however. So mostly are, are they? Transition. Are they Muslim based? Are they? They are pretty much yeah. um, through that. Muslim lens. Uh, the first film is kind of like the forty-year-old virgin, but like if it was a little brown girl at the center of it. So that's a good pitch. Thank you. Yeah, I do. I that's do a what good, I can. That's a good pitch. Yeah. <laughs> so that's kind of um, the the f- one of my features. That's the lowest budget that would probably make the most sense to film afterwards. Well, I, you know, I I think you can tap into the market. You know, yeah, I mean, it's super niche. You've and got, that's in. And, and you know, I, I talk a lot about the idea of uh, everyone has a thousand true fans. Mm-hmm. Well, this this idea, this story, this culture has more than a thousand true fans. Right. You know, and 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 look at. Um, um, you know the big sick, and I mean, you right. know, th- there's, you know, there's, it's not, so, yeah. it's not so foreign to us anymore, right, right. you know. And look at, I, mean, I feel so fortunate to kind of be the second generation mm-hmm. in in that in that South Asian come up, mm-hmm. because you got people like Aziz and um, Kumail, essentially like explaining the themes so that I don't have yeah, yeah. to explain right. them anymore. Shh. I can just tell nuanced stories about them and have fun. So I feel very fortunate in, uh, in that. And, and you know. 
I think that what you, the analogy you made to the Coen brothers, you know, you know, look at some of their their specific films, you know, not the not Fargo's right. and stuff like that, where it's really about their culture and their, mm -hmm. you know, I mean, I think you could tap into that really Absolutely. interestingly. Who who was I'm just blanking on his no. name now, uh, Asif Mandi, mm -hmm. Mandi, right? That's mm -hmm. you know from the mm -hmm. Daily Show. I mean, he's made some really interesting films. He really has, yeah. Uh, you know, and they're low budget, but and they're mm -hmm. niche. I mean, I probably maybe you and I are the only two people who've seen them in probably. Chicago, but I mean. <laughs> He's, he he has a vision that he wants to do, and you don't mm -hmm. really think of him as a filmmaker, but right. that's it. So I, I think yeah. that I think timing is really good for you right now. That's what I'm told. <laughs> <laughs> Everyone's like, "Hey, you're super in the zeitgeist, dude," and I'm like, "Thank you." <laughs> so <laughs> so so, do you have? Do you want to leave Chicago? You want to stay here? What do you want to do? I think I'm gonna leave Chicago. Um, I loved my time here so much, but I need warmer weather. <laughs> <laughs> it's so cold all the time and it makes me so sad um and it's interesting my dad when he first immigrated to the states he, he immigrated to la mm -hmm. and he was 24 and i'm 23 right now but i think by the time i get my shit together to have a car i'll be 24 as well and so it'll be fun to to match him in that and, and pack up and go to la mm -hmm. yeah. yeah i mean it so is, is held ramus uh film school are they do they have at a, at a traditional college, you have career services department mm -hmm. or alumni services yeah. or something like that. Obviously, they have a ton of connections and they have a ton right. of connections in both New York and, and L.A., but do they have some sort of pathway to help you? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, what, what is it? They do. They have a kind of um, a career liaison as well, also from Columbia. Um, and she has been, like, she always is emailing who, who? us. Lynn? Putsai. No, don't know. No. Yeah. She was always emailing us with opportunities here in Chicago as like PAs and, and, and mm -hmm. things like that. And then, um, no, so I'm in the inaugural class. We've had a student that got just like purely through connections with Second City, a great job. Um, Doing what? A, he's a personal assistant for Peter Tolan. Oh, nice. Yeah. So yeah, yeah. very, very cool yeah. gig. And, um, we and so we have people over there that are like just waiting on us to get them scripts and and whatnot to, to help us out in that regard. Um, it is interesting, I think, being in the inaugural class, not having a precedent set, and mm -hmm. being essentially what the precedent will be. Um, as far as what that will be, right now it's it's a lot of like, don't expect them to give you a job, which is. Of a course. good lesson yeah. to learn, <laughs> you know, no one's yeah. going to give you a job. Um, but if you have something really worth getting to someone, they'll do what they can to to get the script to Paul Feig's office or whatever. Oh, you know, great. like um, that hasn't I don't know if that's going to happen. That hasn't happened yet. But I'm sure if like you have a polished script and, and sure. that's the guy, sure. they would do it. And at least could. at least they'll get it to his reader. Absolutely. You know, right. That, right. You know, that, I think that's, that's very it's a very reachable thing. So it sounds like the the decision you made to leave Texas to come here was all the right decision. Yeah, best I don't see decision, any regrets on your face at all. Not at all. At all. You yeah. know. Um, so I'm going to ask it as we wrap up here. Uh, mm -hmm. Any questions? Anything I can do to help? Like I said, I, I, I know some people. I'm going to see if I can find some folks. Anything? Oh, you want to do this now? Okay, great. <laughs> um, no. Okay. So you are a filmmaker. Yes. What is the most challenging thing for you as a filmmaker? Uh, getting the job. You know, honestly, yeah. you know, uh, so I have gone through uh, careers, uh, you know, a, a journey. So when I was a student, I was always worried about, you know, we were shooting film then. So you had to get it processed. Did we get exposure? You know, mm -hmm. and because you had no budget, you know, r really, are the actors going to show up? Are you going to get everything you need? Right. Mm -hmm. And that was terrifying right. because you didn't know you had no control. Right. But then as soon as you got a little bit of money, you stopped worrying about that stuff. And then you could focus on their creativity. So mm -hmm. so now my worry is, frankly, getting the money to do what I want to do. Right. Uh, working with the people I want to work with. But the worries that I see a lot of students and a lot of young filmmakers have, I don't have anymore because once I I get a, my green light, either from a client or from myself, I have the resources at, right. at hand. So the hardest part is getting those resources. Mm -hmm. And that's why I suggested to you bring in a producer yeah, or bump absolutely. up the AD because you're just going to fight yourself all the time right. on that. Absolutely. You know, so that's, that's one thing. It just, the hardest thing was just getting over that and being mm -hmm. comfortable. And, 
I think naturally, and I can just tell from talking to you, you have a vision of the stories you want to tell, you know, and you will get better as you do it more. Oh, you know, so. you just you just will. <laughs> I mean, you'll 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 learn a shortcut. You'll mm-hmm. learn shorthand. You'll 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 find people you like working right. with, and it will just become easy. So so that's not really a worry for me. But you know, if I were you, but um, yeah, I can't wait until I get cool. Yeah, you know, you know what <laughs> yeah, I mean, like, like when you're just like chill, you're on set yeah. and you're just doing your job. Yeah. <laughs> I can't wait for that. Yeah, so I, I was at the Tribeca Film Festival a few years ago, and I met Kenneth Lonergan, mm-hmm. uh, who wrote and directed Manchester by the Sea. Mm-hmm. You know, won an Oscar for that. Yeah, he's, he's yeah. amazing. What a fantastic freaking absolutely! Film. And he was a sweet, sweet guy. And and um, he said something that he. I was with some students. He said it, and I really believe this. He said. He doesn't know anyone who has kept at it in the industry for 10 years that doesn't have a job. Mm-hmm. And that oddly makes perfect sense because right. if you quit the industry, you're not going to have a job. Mm-hmm. And if you keep at it, the only way you're going to keep at it is if you get a job. So, right. again, you just have to keep doing it. Yeah, I think when I moved to Chicago, that was really the thing I wanted to know. Like, how palatable is this? Yeah. Like, how like, is this even a real world? Yeah. Like, Hollywood just seems like such a crazy reach from Houston, Texas, you know? Sure. It's, it doesn't even seem like a viable <laughs> career option. So, so do you do you have a job? I do. What do you do? I'm a barista. Ah. Yeah. Yeah. So, so just live in the dream. Do you, uh, if I can ask, do you have mm-hmm. insurance or you still on your, you're young enough to you still yeah, on your parents' I'm insurance. Dad's. That's great. Thanks. Yeah. Keep, keep on that as long oh, well. as you can, you know? Yeah. Um, 26. I'm not even going to get married. I don't <laughs> even care. <laughs> I feel like this is more important. Yeah. Yeah. No, that, seriously. So, so keep doing that. You know, I was, um, I, I graduated college and it was five years before I was on a film set. But mm-hmm. I, I kept working. I kept mm-hmm. writing a script and kept writing a script and I kept at it. Yeah, and writing didn't... is hard. Yeah. Yeah. I went home. I had a job and I went home every night and worked on the script. Mm-hmm. And it took a bunch of time and a bunch yeah. of people and, and networking. Everyone says, oh, network, network, network. This is where Harold Ramis was, is going to be great for you because of right. the built-in network plus the people you met while you right. were there. It's like for someone who hates networking, kind of a dream. Yeah. Yeah. Because – it's it's not like you're not asking people for help necessarily. You just get to have conversations and you reap the benefits from yeah. being able to talk to these guys. Yeah. Um, and I hope I hope the scope of networking changes a little bit. You know, it's just, it's such a weird, it's still such a weird thing for me. Yeah. Um. Well, you know, you make this film, right? And you get it in film festivals, and then that will change. I things. love that. You'll start I love meeting the idea other people. of letting my work do all the yeah, talking, right. and I can just. Be like, hey guys. Well, then, then <laughs> well, even even if not film festivals, once you get it finished, you can send links to it. You right. Know, you can just YouTube, and then the the that's work the will talk. That's the portfolio. Yeah. Right. Yeah. That, that's what it's cool. all about. Yeah. They, ultimately, they don't care. They don't care if you get your college degree or not. They mm-hmm. care about the quality of the work. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Cool. Anything else? Um, what's your best advice for someone who's like, well, like someone who is coming from like a marginalized group and is trying to make films in in that space. Uh, but that's a really great idea and I don't know if I've I've ever been asked that question directly, mm-hmm. but I think that what you said earlier uh your your time is now. <laughs> so you have that going for you and I would believe in this and I I said this earlier, you have a thousand true fans. If you stick to your vision about these are the stories I'm going to tell and I'm going to go after this audience, you will get that audience. So so stick to your guns on mm-hmm. that. Don't veer off and try to make something for everybody. Right. You know, make something for you and your audience and they'll find it. And then once mm-hmm. you get some success, you can slide over into it into right. a, a larger a Marvel audience. movie. <laughs> right. Of course. <laughs> of course. I mean, uh, what would be the uh, Black Panther equivalent? Well, they have the new Miss Marvel is Baksani American. Miss Kamala Khan. So I would love to work on that. But she's still a very young superhero, so she needs a few she needs her to run her miles before she gets her own movie. <laughs> That's good, dude. Um yeah, I mean, your 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 time's now. And and I think you're you're you've teed yourself up right. Just don't quit. Just right. <laughs> just keep just keep doing it. I don't plan on quitting. Great. So cool. Well thank you for coming. Thank you so much for having me. This was fun. Great. Thanks. <laughs> All right, everybody, that's the show. Thank you, Jack. Thank you, Danya. I really appreciate it. Great conversation. Danya, good luck with your film. You're shooting uh, this coming weekend, so I hope it uh, is is a big success for you. I know I've put a couple crew members your way. I hope uh, they do a good job. If not, let me know, and I will uh, 
uh, grade them down. <laughs> uh, anyway, thank you all. Thanks for listening. Thanks you to uh, Andrew Shabbat at SoundMaker Post. Uh, thanks for listening on all of the platforms, iTunes and Stitcher and SoundCloud and Google Play and all of the other places. Uh, send me another email. It was nice reading an email earlier, teachinginthearts at gmail.com or teachinginthearts.com directly on the website. I am out of here. It is time for me to get a drink.